So we're in the next unit of this class, which is a real hard left turn from just talking about properties of vector functions. Um, and we're going to talk about Fourier series and transformations, first series, then transformations. Uh, but before we do that, I want to put this in a little bit of context, like why this is important. And actually, this is one of the few rare topics that's both um, practically important and kind of theoretically important. Um, I want to go all the way back to the idea of a vector itself. So you guys know that a vector is a thing that lives in space and it's a geometric entity and I can express it in terms of multiple different coordinate systems. So V itself is equally well expressed as Vx, you know, i hat, notation we've been using, Vy j hat plus Vz k hat. Or I could come up with another more useful coordinate system, maybe V1 E1 hat plus V2 E2 hat plus V3 E3 hat, right? But the vector is the vector. So what I kind of would like you guys to maybe think about is the fact that a function has a lot of similar properties is I could actually express a function y equals f of x, and I could so-called discretize it. Through the following set of pairs, so I could, for instance, keep track of, um, call this like x1, and this would be y1 equals f of x1, and then I could have y2, and this would be at x2, and so on and so forth, dot, 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 and then I get out to xn. Um, no reason to believe these would all be positive, and this would be yn equals f of xn. Okay? So this has a lot of the same properties in some sense, is I could think about this is a vector. I could think about the collection of y as y1, y2, dot, 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 yn. And I could ask the same sort of question, is, is this the only basis that I could choose for this function? And in a sense, that's what Fourier series and their generalizations through things called uh, wavelets, for instance, really are in a sense. It's an alternate way of representing a function that you're used to seeing in what we'll call the position basis. So this, you know, or fk if you want to call it that, whatever. Um, think about this as f1, f2, dot, 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 fk, or fn, um, is usually expressed in what you could call the position basis. And this is an n-dimensional vector, and we get the function back. So first thing about this is an m-dimensional vector. And we get f of x as n goes to uncountably infinite. I'm just going to write as n goes to infinity. Obviously, there are some subtleties there. You know, there's an uncountably infinite number of places where we could ask what the value of this vector is. Okay, but this is the important point, is that just like vectors can be expressed in different bases, which are useful at different times, so can functions. And that's essentially what Fourier series do. So what this is, in some sense, is the position basis. And the full details of why this is called the position basis and why the thing we're about to introduce is called the momentum basis a lot of times will be unraveled to you in uh, quantum mechanics. But I could express this in some sense in the same way that I express this, is I could call this my representation of f the vector. This would be f1 times a vector that looked like this. 1, 1, and then n minus 1 zeros, plus f2, scalar, scalar, times this vector, and then dot, 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 f, n, 0, 0, dot, 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 last thing's a 1. And what you see is that 
these basis vectors, just like these basis vectors, satisfy the properties of a real basis, namely that if I dot something with itself, I get one, and if I dot or scale or product something with any of these other ones, they get zero. So in fact, there are these position basis vectors where we could say this whole thing in more elegant notation is some k goes from 1 to n, fk, that's the component, and then ek hat, where ek itself, great use of the Dirac delta function, ek's kth jth component, is delta kj. So each one of these basis vectors is n minus 1 zeros, and then a 1 when the basis vectors um, label itself matches that component, right? So this has a one in the first component. It's the first basis vector zeros everywhere else. Okay, we're not going to dig too much into this. Just realize this really is a basis, and these really can be expressed in some sense as vectors. Um, so now the question is, is there another basis that we could use? And I will write down one, and you'll see that it's got all of the right sort of properties. And I'm going to give it a name in quotes, because you probably can't stop somebody in the hallway and say, like, um, momentum basis, and they won't know exactly what you mean. But if you explain a little bit, they'll say, aha, I see what you're saying. So we want to express this function, this collection of points, and truly the function itself, um, in a different way. And I'll come up with a different basis, and we'll call them q's, I guess. So let's take q1, the basis vector, to be equal to 1 over root n. And it's all 1's. Okay. And uh, just to make our lives easy, n is a power of p, so it could be 1, that would be really boring. It could be 2, it could be 4, it could be 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, and so forth. And then q2, 1 over root n, that's just to normalize it. And then what we're going to do is we're going to have the first half be positive ones, and then the second half be negative ones. Where this element is n over 2, and this is n over 2 plus 1. Okay. So first half positives, next half negatives. And what you can see is that if I take the dot product of this thing with itself, likewise with this one, I get n1s because I square them. I'll add it up, so n over n is 1. Good. And then when I dot this with this, take the scalar product in between these two, I should get 0. So all positives, half positives, half negatives, this should add up to 0. And then I can keep subdividing until I get out to qn, which is 1 over the square root of n. And then we just alternate plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, minus 1, all the way out to the end, minus 1. Right? Plus 1, minus 1. And you can see that if I dot that with that and that with that, um, we would get all all the properties of the basis. So dot product of thing with itself should give me 1. With another thing, it should be 0. So as a quick example, let me write down the basis vectors for n equals 2 to the 3 equals 8. So 1 over root 8. My first best basis vector would look like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Great. And then my next basis vector would look like this. And my next basis vector would look like this. Okay. Okay. And so I'll run out of boardroom, but you can see see the pattern where I'm alternating ones and negative ones, and then eventually I'll get out to 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1. Okay. Good? Great. 
So this is a possible basis vector. The question is, why would I ever want to use this? Um, the reason to use this in a physics department is because it turns out, as the name suggests, this will actually tell you the momentum of quantum mechanical things, or a version of this that we're about to get to, sines and cosines. The reason you would want to use this in an electrical engineering or a computer science department is that um, this is an elegant way of representing things that wiggle, right? So if you're talking about compressing um, audio or visual files, you know, easily you can think about music. So music is wiggly sound waves. If you just keep track of some of these wiggles, so this is basically the lowest and second lowest and third lowest frequency wiggle, you can truncate all of the stuff above human hearing and you can save some space. So compression algorithms rely on this. So this is the basis of a discrete Fourier series, essentially. Um, why we care about doing this is because there's a lot of um, pure math problems namely the first time you'll see this is with a damped driven oscillator that can be solved by changing the inhomogeneous differential equation itself into a momentum basis and there are also actual basic physics questions that should be answered in a momentum basis once you get to quantum mechanics so this is just kind of the um, the invitation, is that this is all we're doing, is we're changing the basis of a function. The function is still the function itself. So this is Fourier's theorem. So let's take a periodic function. And the important part is can be represented. So this is just a different way of expressing it in the same way that we can have a vector expressed in multiple different ways. So we're expressing the vector in an infinite sum of sines and cosines. And the analogy to this discrete momentum basis I just wrote down should make sense a little bit, where this would be a low frequency sine or cosine, and this would be a higher frequency sine or cosine. So this is more to the point Fourier's theorem. Uh, sines and cosines have no mean value, so we got to add a mean value. So sines, cosines, infinite sum, and then uh, t is the period of the function. Okay, so Fourier's theorem extends this to non-periodic functions. Um, the interesting thing about this is that if you know these coefficients, so if you know the a's and the b's, you know everything there is to know about the function. So this is you know, the most useful way of um, context in which to think about this is the compression algorithm use of Fourier series, is that if you know a's and b's, you know everything there is to know about the function. Otherwise stated, the entire um, The entire function is specified by the collection of coefficients a n and b n. Right. So small amount of information, and then you are able to recreate this function. OK, um, I will hint at how this is done, but I just want to quickly transition to a Mathematica video and show you this in action, is what happens usually is you take a sequential series and you add as many terms as you need to do as good of a job as you need to do. So this again would be kind of the compression algorithm way of thinking about things. 
And I'll hint at how this is done, but we'll take a periodic function, and then I'll show you this in a second. So let's just take um, so we'll take this rectangular wave, and it has a period of how about four, and let's go in between two and zero. So we go 2, 0, 2, 0, 2. Okay. So this has a lot of properties that you'll see. So this is periodic. It's periodic with period 8. So period is 8 units. And this thing is going to have an A0 term because um, it has a non-zero average. And then if you think about the even or oddness of this, you can figure out that it also might have certain, um, certain values and not other values. Okay? So it turns out that this is completely described by um, so we'll just say Fourier magic happens for now. So A0 has an average value, so I don't think that um, disappears, the average value is 2, and then all of the a n's are 0 because of the even or oddness of this, and then the b n's on the sines, this is an odd function, turns out to be 4 over pi n. So this is all I need to know to specify this function. So if I told somebody in the electrical engineering department I have periodic function with period 8, a naught is 2, bn is 4 pi n, they would produce this plot, like no ambiguity whatsoever. So that's kind of the miracle of this. So how this happens in practice is, in some sense, how you do... Um, if I want to find v k in some exotic coordinate system, what I do is I take the dot product of v with ek. So the analog of that for Fourier series is if I want to find a n, what I do is I take the dot product of f of x with the nth, uh, in this case, a, so cosine. What is a dot product for two functions? Well, that turns out to be an integral, so from 0 to t. And I'll just say proportional. So essentially what we're doing is the same sort of process, where if I want to know some coefficient, I take the dot product with the basis vector. That will turn into an integral over the period of the overlap in between our function and the relevant cosine in this case and sine in that case. So it is all super analogous to vector stuff that we've done before. Right, so let me show you that. So here is a Mathematica notebook with exactly what I just wrote down without deriving. Um, and the way this works is, so we had, again, the rectangular wave with a period of 8. So you can see it here. Um, it's 2 for 4 units, and then it's 0 for 4 units, and then repeats. So you hear, see, you see it at negative 8 to 0, and you hear, see it from 0 to 8. Um, what this is is each of the individual terms and then partially summed. So the sum is the partial sum of um, from 1 to m terms. So what I'm plotting is the partial sum of the first 0 terms here, and then also the first 0 terms, and then uh, as a stand-in for the function itself, the first 4,000 terms. So right now, it's plotting just the a naught, the average value, and the average value of a function that spends half its time at 2 and half its time at 0 is 1, so I like that. And then let's change this. So let's plot the first two terms. And this is a sign. And then let's plot the first four terms summed together. 
as well. Okay, so you can see that this thing is starting to look a little bit more like the rectangular wave. So let's just keep kind of leapfrogging up and let's plot the first 10 terms. You can see how that does even better. So that's the dark yellow curve. And now let's plot the first 40 terms. And again, you'll see this is successive approximation of a sum of sines, in this case sines, because this is an odd function that doesn't have any of the cosine terms. Gets better and better and better, so let's set them all equal to something really big. So let's do 400 and 1,000, and this is going to take a while, so um, probably not long enough for a knock-knock joke, but certainly will take a couple of seconds. Ta-da. And now it really looks like this square wave, so this, sorry, rectangle wave. Um, and this turns out to be true for any function, even if it's not smooth. So we can have a discontinuity. Fourier series handles it in a particular way. But this looks pretty good. So there's a little thing there called Gibbs phenomenon, the ringing at the end. But we're going to learn how to do this and then get a couple of examples.